Let's talk about something we as skeptics, skeptics find hard to believe. People tend to stick to their irrational, unproven ideas, whatever is said or proven to them. Why? And what could we do to change this? So now we have two keynote speakers. First, we have two talks with Massimo Perglucci and Martin Boudry. After that, we'll have discussion uh, between the two and take questions from the audience, like I said. Um, the app uh, can be used for the questions. So first, we have Massimo Bellucci. I, I have some trouble pronouncing your name. But <laughs> you have to do it yourself again, OK? Um, some of you might know Massimo as the author of Nonsense on Stilts, a book on how to tell science from bunk, from nonsense. He was co-host at the podcast Rationally Speaking. He is a bi biologist by training and also a professor at CUNY uh, at, uh, in New York City. And he used to run Scientia Salon, all kinds of uh, media outings to be a skeptic in the fall. So Massimo, you have your own mic? Yes, I do. Does this thing work? Hopefully, yes. Okay, go ahead, Thank Massimo. You. Thank you. Thank you, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me get straight to the talk because I have half an hour. I was hoping that Martin wouldn't show up so to have the whole hour, but he's here. So uh, in, the, in the last half an hour, the only words that I understood were Donald Trump. And for a second I thought, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong place here. But now it sounds like it's the Skeptic Congress. So let me start by uh, briefly telling you what I think skepticism is and is not about. You should know that because you're skeptics. Uh, but sometimes there's some confusion, and I think that uh, we need to be clear on that, and then I'll try to um, bring in the middle of the, of the talk, uh, bring up a concept from philosophy, uh, from epistemology, that is called virtue epistemology, which I think should be of interest to skeptics. If you haven't heard of, of it, I will tell you in a couple of minutes what it is about. Then I'll give you a couple of examples of why I think uh, skeptics sometimes fail in their, in their duty, in their, in their, at their job. Uh, and then we'll conclude with a few general remarks about what we should do and what we can do better. So, uh, of course, skepticism is often referred to as sort of this kind of famous phrase by Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, um, which is actually a version, a modern version of something that was uh, said by David Hume back in the 1700s, uh, a wise man proportions his beliefs to the evidence. This is the idea that, you know, if I believe something, belief is a number, it's, it's a question of degrees. Uh, I can have little belief in something, high degrees in something, very high degree of belief in something. And uh, ideally, if you are a critically thinking person, uh, your beliefs should be proportioned to the evidence. The more evidence there is for a belief, the more you're going to trust it, the less evidence, the less you're going to trust it. What you're not doing ever is either completely trust a belief or never completely distrust a belief. Because if you go to the extremes, if your trust is 100% or zero, basically you have something that's called faith. It becomes in, uh, independent of the evidence, and you're not supposed to do that. Now, I see skepticism over the last, let's say, 40 or 50 years uh, after World War II as evolving in a number of different directions. Broadly speaking, there are two major uh, areas of concern to skeptics. One is uh, on, the, on the left of this slide. So this is a what I would call classical skepticism. So uh, people are concerned with things like astrology, UFOs, Bigfoot, uh, telepathy, that kind of stuff, right? This is where the original skepticism came out of the 1960s and 70s. In fact, uh, it was a reaction really to the new age movements of the 60s, and it's particularly the, the emphasis on astrology, ESP, and things like that. More recently, Maybe, yes. More recently, sto um, um, skepticism got into uh, you know, more complicated matters, things that are actually much less clear, uh, things like uh, that have, they're much heavier in science. So uh, are vaccines connected to uh, autism or not? Uh, is homeopathy, it's interesting that we have an homeopathic uh, meeting apparently, which must be a very, very ratified meeting with the audience gets smaller and smaller and the meeting gets better and better. Um, Things like scientific creationism, that Jesus, that's Jesus over there on top of a, of a dinosaur. 
um, and of course the climate change uh, denialism. These are more recent, uh, um, especially the, the vaccines and, and climate change, and they tend to get closer and closer to actually hard science. It's, uh, it's easy enough to explain why astrology doesn't work or UFOs don't exist. Uh, it gets a little more difficult when you're going to get into a technical discussion about climate change, because unless you know something about climatology and physics, it's going to be tough. Then there are some areas where I think skeptics have little or nothing to say of relevance. Two of those are, on the left, philosophy. I hear uh, recently a lot of skeptics, including high-level high skeptics such as Lawrence Krauss and Richard Dawkins, uh, that talk about philosophy in skeptical terms. And I can tell you, as a professional philosopher, they have no idea what they're talking about, so they should really not do it. It's not their area of expertise. On the right side of the screen, you have things like very complex theories in science, such as string theory in physics. That's also an area where, unless you actually are a physicist, it's hard to say anything meaningful about it. So this is, these are not good areas of practice for skepticism as we understand it. Now, what's the difference between those three categories? So I'll show you the classical skepticism, the sort of more modern skepticism, and then things about which skeptics I don't think have anything particular to say. The difference between these three, I think, is this. In the first group, we have uh, a situation where skeptics actually have unique expertise, better than the expertise of scientists. Most scientists don't know anything about astrology or ufology or uh, telepathy and things like that because they just don't bother. And they're not actually good at empirically investigating those, uh, those areas because they're too easily fooled by magicians and tricksters and things like that. That's an area where skeptics really can do original research and original field, uh, field research because they have the expertise. They have, you know, James Rand is not a, 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 a scientist, but he knows much better than the scientists about that sort of stuff. The second group, the second category where the science begins to come in more heavily, that's a situation where skeptics themselves rely on scientific expertise, okay? Uh, and so they become basically mediators uh, to the public. Most of us, I don't know about you, but, but I certainly don't know anything about climate change. I don't, I'm not a physicist, okay? So if I had to explain to somebody, you know, how a climate change model works, I have no idea. I, I haven't the foggiest. Uh, the reason I think that climate science is, is a serious science is because it's done by serious scientists. So I actually have trust into the scientific community, and so I'm simply trying to explain to other people the very basics, the very rudiments, because I understand those. But if somebody wants to engage in a technical debate with me on climate science, I can't do it. I have to call a climatologist. I have to call somebody who actually knows who he's talking about. And then, as I said, the third area is a situation where skeptics, by and large, have no expertise uh, not even, not only as a primary source, so like in the first case, but not even as a secondary source. Most people just don't know enough about fundamental physics, let's say, or, or philosophy to actually engage even at a low-level conversation with it, and that's why I think we should just stay away from it and call people who actually know what they're talking about. Now, this thing of knowing what you're talking about when you do want to talk to other people is, I think, crucial, and it is the center, the core of my talk today. I think it's something that we should pay attention and be more concerned with. And that's why I'm, I'm bringing in this uh, concept of so-called virtue epistemology. So epistemology, of course, is a branch of uh, philosophy that deals with theory of knowledge. It tells you about what does it mean to know something and under what conditions people can claim knowledge or not claim knowledge about things. A virtue epistemology is a particular type of approach to epistemology, which I'm going to explain very quickly in, in a second. Uh, it is derived from the broader concept of virtue ethics, which goes back to Aristotle. The idea of virtue ethics is that uh, the, the focus should be on the individual, it should be on, your vir on practicing certain kinds of virtue. So if you're a virtuous person, according to Aristotle, for instance, you're, you're wise, you're courageous, uh, you, are, you have self-control, uh, you have respect for justice, that kind of things. If you are a virtue epistemologist, uh, as opposed to simply virtue ethicist more generally, then you are practicing certain virtues. I'll give you a list, a partial list of virtues as a skeptic that I think will make you uh, a virtue epistemologist. But I'll get there in a second. The idea is that what matters are not the properties, not just the properties of beliefs, but also the, peop the, the, the people that actually hold those beliefs and how they behave. Beliefs 
can change over time. Evidence changes. And so it may be reasonable at one, at one point to believe something and unreasonable at, at a second point not to believe it, and so on and so forth. Things, people change because the evidence changes. But the attitude, the internal attitude of people that, are, that want to consider themselves critical thinkers and skeptics, I think should be, in fact, more constant and more, more balanced. In other, term, in other words, virtue epistemology directs the attention of the knower uh, to the knower as an agent that is resp responsible for her beliefs. We are individually responsible for what we believe. And we need to take ownership of why do we believe certain things and why don't believe certain things. If somebody challenges you, of, you know, why do you believe this, uh, then you have to be able to give them a good response. If you don't give them a good response, you know better than... Um, those people out there are there uh, who just believe stuff because other people told them so. Now, why use virtue epistemology as an approach to a, to a theory of knowledge? Because uh, science, which is what we all use in order to uh, uh, sort of assess our beliefs about things, uh, does not have a God's eye view of the world. Scientists are not more objective than other human beings. Uh, they just have the same kind of biases and the same kind of problems that every other human being does. We don't get to see the world, the cosmos, from the outside and look it down and say, oh yeah, I see how things work. We just don't have that access. What we do have, maybe, yes. What we do have is a particular point of view as human beings. Human knowledge is human knowledge. It's not universal knowledge. We don't, we don't have access to a universal level of, of understanding. We only have a human understanding. And therefore, it is limited to the particular human perspective. I like that diagram because it shows you really very nicely what it means to have a human perspective. So that uh, geometrical figures in the middle is labeled as the truth. That's the, if you had a God's eye view of things, you would see that and only that. But we don't have a God's eye view of things. We have only projections. We're looking at just partial images, partial projections of the truth. And as you can see, those two partial projections are equally true because they're seen from the same object. It's seen from different perspective. But if you can start arguing. If you don't know that, you can start arguing. You say, no, it's really a square. No, no, it's really an ellipse. No, it's a square. No, it's an ellipse. It's both, as it turns out, in that particular case. It just depends on your perspective. So this is a list, a partial list of virtues, epistemic virtues and epistemic vices. Uh, so I suggest if you want to be a good skeptic, you should be on the left side of that table. Uh, you should be attentive to things. You should uh, use the principle of charity. Always give your opponents the best possible argument, not caricature of that argument. You should be conscientious, creative, curious. You should exercise discernment. You should be honest. Uh, you should practice humility. Uh, you should... Uh, be, try to be as objective as possible, use parsimony, so use as, as little as possible in terms of theoretical constructs. Uh, you should study things, you should really try to understand stuff, uh, and you should always be ready to present your warrant to other people for your beliefs. You, that is, why is it that you believe certain things? Ultimately, you should try to be a wise knower. What you don't want to do uh, is the stuff that's on the right. You don't want to be close-minded, dishonest, dogmatic, gullible, obtuse, uh, self-deceiving, superficial, and engaging in wishful thinking. Right? Anybody wants to be on the right side of that? No. Okay, good. So now that we understand each other, let's see a couple of examples where we actually fail. Because we learn from our failures, not, not, that, not so much from our successes. Um, I'm going to present you two cases. One is a famous debate that happened in the 1970s about astrology. And this is known in philosophy of science as Paul Feyerabend's defense of astrology. Paul Feyerabend is that guy up there, was a very influential philosopher of science. He wrote this book called Against Method, in which he basically claims that there is no such thing as a scientific method. That scientists are pragmatic. They use whatever comes their way. If it works, they use it. When it stops working, they don't use it anymore. Uh, so, so when we talk to other people and say, well, you should use the scientific method, Paul Feyerabend would say, what scientific method? There is no such thing. Uh, there is, it's not an algorithm. It's not like something you can put in a computer and say, yeah, there it is. Step one, step two, step three, and you got the result. It actually doesn't work that way. So he was a very controversial philosopher of science. Back in the 70s, in 1975, Paul Kurtz, who is the you know, grandfather of the, the modern skeptic movement, the guy that established the Skeptical Inquirer magazine, uh, the Center for Inquiry, all this stuff. He passed away a few years ago, and Paul was a philosopher uh, as well. 
he got together 186 different scientists to sign a manifesto against astrology. Right? So one of these things where you say, oh, we think that this is bullshit and here's why. Right? So this is what the manifesto, how the manifesto read in part. I'm going to give you very quickly some of the flavor of what the manifesto said. We, the underside, astronomers, astrophysicists, etc., wish to caution the public against the unquestioning acceptance of the prediction and advice given private, privately and publicly by astrologers. In ancient times, people believed in the predictions and advice of astrologers because astrology was part and parcel of their magical worldview. So the manifesto explains why people believe in astrology. Why do people believe in astrology? In these un uncertain times, many long, uh, long for the comfort of having guidance in making decisions. Now, this came out, it was signed by 186 uh, scientists. One notable scientist and skeptic who did not sign it was Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan is one of my personal you know, heroes. He was one of the role models when I was growing up. Uh, and I got into skepticism in part because of reading uh, things like, by Carl Sagan, especially the demon hunted world. So it's kind of surprising that Sagan did not sign on purpose. It's not like he was left over or he forgot. He, he, on purpose, he didn't, he didn't sign the, the, uh, the manifesto. And so he was asked, asked why? why what, what's wrong with the manifesto? And Sagan said, I struggled with the wording and in the end found myself unable to sign, not because I thought astrology has any validity, whatever, but because I felt that the tone of the statement was authoritarian. It criticized astrology for having origins shrouded in superstition. But this is true as well of religion, chemistry, medicine, and astronomy, to mention just a few. Uh, the issue is not what faltering and rudimentary knowledge astrology came from, but what its present day validity is. Right? So his point is astrology had the same origin as, as, as astronomy. But we don't, wouldn't use that kind of origin as an argument against astronomy. We would look at what astronomy says, the warrant of the evidence, and then we'll decide accordingly. And he kept going, he said that then there was speculation of the psychological motivations of those who believe in astrology. Well, these motivations might explain why astrology is not generally given the scrutiny that it deserves, but it is peripheral to the, whether it works or not. So it doesn't matter why psychologically people believe in this or that or the other. What matters is if that belief is actually warranted or not. The statement stressed that we can think of no mechanism by which astrology could work. Well, that's true, and it's a re relevant point, but it's in itself, in itself uh, unconvincing. No mechanism was known, for instance, for continental drift when it was proposed by Alfred Wagner in the first quarter of the 20th century, and yet that's good science. So the fact that you don't know the mechanism or something at a particular moment in time doesn't actually invalidate necessarily uh, that, that. Remember, he didn't believe in astrology, so he's not defending astrology, right? Now, uh, Fair Abend went even harsher on the writers, on, on the subscribers to the, to the uh, a manifesto. He said, the learned gentlemen, the scientists, the 186 scientists, have strong convictions. They use their authority to spread these convictions. Why 186 signatures if one has an argument? You know, only, in fact, Einstein, I saw the, the, I didn't read anything of what was said here, but I saw Einstein here. And Einstein famously said, you know, at the, at the time, there was a lot of skepticism uh, about the general theory of relativity even among some physicists. And at some point, a group of physicists in Germany had a, signed a manifesto against general relativity, and it was signed by something like 100 people. And this was told to Einstein, and Einstein's reply was pretty much along the same line. He said, why do they need 100? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. That's it. All you need is an argument. You don't need 100 signatures. Uh, they know a few phrases which sound like arguments, but they certainly don't know what they're talking about. So he was accusing the scientists signing the manifesto of basically using their authority to trash somebody else's ideas without actually knowing anything of the details of that idea. Again, Feyerabend wasn't uh, defending astrology. He was simply criticizing the way in which the skeptics were going about it, right? using authority and not arguments. The judgment of the 186 scientists rests on antediluvian anthropology, ignorance of more recent results in their own fields, as well as failure to perceive the implications of the result they do know. It shows the extent to which scientists are prepared to assert their authority, even in areas in which they have no knowledge whatsoever. Like what I said a few minutes ago about Lawrence Krauss. This is going live? No. Okay. Lawrence might be watching. Um, Fair Abend was also critical of astrology, however. 
right? And he concluded, it is interesting to see how closely both parties approach each other in, in ignorance, conceit, and the wish of easy, for easy power over minds. So he basically said, look, it's not like astrology is any better. They're just both making the same mistakes. They're all talking by, by authority and without the evidence to back them up. So they were not acting virtuously, neither the astrologers nor the signatories of the, of the anti-astrology manifesto. The second example that I want to show you concerns the famous case of the Campeche UFOs in Mexico. Let me give you some facts. On 5 March 2004 at night, an um, aircraft of the Mexican government was flying over the uh, state of Campeche uh, looking for evidence of drug smuggling, of course. And the crew uh, videotaped the appearance of up to 11 unidentified objects that seemed to be visible only in the infrared. Um, initially, there was a claim that the objects were uh, also located by the, the radar. They were not seen on the radar. But the images are there. The video is there. You can actually download. You can still see it online. Okay? There is a video of these 11 lights that seem to be moving around. Now, the local skeptics immediately provided explanations to the UFO sighting because they knew, of course, there couldn't be a UFO, an actual real UFO, like a flying saucer, right? A UFO actually is, in fact, simply an unidentified flying object. So it is a UFO unless you know what it is. But what they meant was they knew there couldn't possibly be, you know, extraterrestrial origins and all that. And so here's some of the answers that the local skeptics provided to the press. Um, Jose de la Herrin, a local astronomer, said that it was meteor fragments. Uh, Julio Herrera of, of Mexico's National Autonomous University said that there were electrical flares in the atmosphere. Uh, Rafael Navarro, also of the National Autonomous University, uh, said that it was uh, sparks of plasma energy. Uh, and then uh, the um, explanation offered by the local Urania Astronomical Society uh, was that it was a group of weather balloons. Well, now, it can't be all those things. It has to be at least, at most, one, which means at least three of these four skeptics are wrong. Turns out all four of them, they're wrong. Because the Campeche UFOs actually were stationary objects on the ground. They were flares erupting from oil wells, like those. Okay? And they only appeared to be moving because the, the aircraft itself was booming around, okay? The point is, the skeptics knew that they couldn't possibly be flying saucers, but they just made up explanations that had nothing to do with reality. That, I would say, was unvirtuous from a point of view of virtue epistemology and undermines skeptics, the credibility of skeptics. You cannot do armchair skepticism. You can't just sit there and say, oh, that probably is meteors. You gotta know, out there, go out there and check you have to gather the evidence. Was it really meteors? Turns out not. Was it really, you know, plasma flares, whatever that is? No, it was something else. It took a skeptical investigator from Skeptical Inquirer to actually go there, check the video, and then figure out what in fact it was. You need to do the research. So, what is the big deal? Well, the problem, I think, is that skepticism shares the core values with science. Okay? We have the same core values as scientists do. And these values include intellectual honesty, epistemic humility, and a number of other virtues like the ones that I showed you. And if we fail at these, then we're not doing our job as skeptics. What is supposed to separate us from the creation is the climate change deniers, the homeopaths, and all that sort of stuff. It's not that we happen to be mostly or often right and that they are not. Because sometimes we're not right either, okay? And sometimes they turn out to be right on something. That's not what separates us. What separates us is that we really allegedly seek the truth, not just whatever is convenient for us or whatever makes us feel better, right? We seek the truth, whatever that truth is. If it turns out that UFOs really do exist and at some point we find out that that's the case, I'd be the first one to go and shake hands with the aliens, okay? I don't think so. I, don't, I doubt it. I'll be surprised if that happened. But if it did happen, then I would have to be the first one to go there in line and say, hey, I was wrong. Welcome to Earth. And of course, if this is any n normal science fiction movie, then I would be zapped out of existence because the Martians are nasty kind of guys. Um, right, so that means that we, do the, we need to do the hard work of doing the research. We just don't sit in an armchair and pontificate. 
It's really bizarre that as a philosopher, you know, I, I grew up as a scientist, basically. My first career was a scientist in biology. And then I turned to philosophy. And as soon as I turned to philosophy, my science colleagues, especially the skeptic science colleagues, I think I already mentioned a couple, so I'm not going to mention them again, uh, tell me, oh, you philosophers, just sit down and do armchair philosophizing. Yes, that's what philosophers do, just like mathematicians. Mathematicians do armchair mathematics. They don't do experiments, okay? But if you're a scientist, you don't get to do that. If you're a skeptic, you don't get to do that. You have to get your ass off your chair and actually do the research. So, in order to be helpful and not just critical, because one of the good things I think about, you know, skeptics too often are seen as sort of kind of cynical people, that, that they tend to say, no, 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 that doesn't exist, that doesn't exist, that doesn't, that's an illusion, that's an illusion. It's all in the negative. But we're actually also in the positive. Both Carl Sagan and David Hume emphasize that skeptics is a positive attitude. You do want to learn new truths. It's just that you don't want to learn baloney. You don't want to accept things that are not true. But you do want to learn, right? So it has to be a positive component to it. That positive component, and my contribution to, to that positive component is this one. This is going to be a checklist for what I call the virtuous skeptic. So check what you're doing the next time you're criticizing the homeopaths next door. Check what you're doing, and if it, if it checks with this list, then you're a virtuous skeptic. If it doesn't, you might need to work a little bit harder. Uh, so ask yourself the following questions. Did I carefully consider my opponent's arguments without dismissing them out of hand? Did I interpret what my opponent said in the most charitable way possible before mounting a response? Did I seriously entertain the possibility that I may be wrong? Or am I too blinded by my own preconceptions? Am I an expert on this matter? And if not, did I consult experts? Or did I just conjure up my own unfounded opinion? Did I check the reliability of my own sources? Or did I just Google whatever was convenient to throw at my opponent? And after having done my research, do I actually know what I'm talking about, or am I simply repeating somebody else's opinion? If all those checks, you're a virtuous skeptic. Let me uh, conclude with a quote, in fact, by Aristotle, who is the one that invented not virtue epistemology, but virtue ethics more broadly. Humility requires us to honor truth above our friends. Even though our friends are skeptics and we would like other skeptics to be right, sometimes they're not. And the truth is more important than our uh, uh, allegiance to our own in-group. If you want to hear, uh, you know, read more about this and related stuff, you can go to my blog, which is Plato's Footnote. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Massimo. Brilliant talk about our own position and virtue. Okay, uh, stuff for thought, I, I think. Um, next speaker is Martin Boudry. Boudry, I, I tend to speak English even in the names. But uh, Martin Boudry uh, is a philosopher at the University of Ghent in Belgium. Uh, we might know him from SCAP and the Denkgelag. In 2012, he wrote a uh, fake theological scientific article and got it published without any problem in a very uh, important uh, Congress uh, uh, publication. And this sparked a huge discussion, again, like the Sokol uh, case before, uh, about the ways science decides what and what is not true or interesting at least. Um, I'm not sure where Martin is. Ah, there you are. Working? Come on stage. <laughs> we'll be hearing from you, your perspective on skepticism uh, for half an hour, and afterwards you'll have a discussion with Massimo. Thanks. Thank you. This seems to be working fine. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Do I have... Okay. Am I loud and clear? I seem to be. I can hear the echo of my own voice. So... Uh, let me just check, oh, good morning, by the way, and thanks for the introduction. Great talk, by the way, Massimo, where is he? Oh, there he is. Um, I'll get back to a couple of points later on. Um, first, let me check the, if I have the most recent version of my slide, and I actually changed one word in the title just to check. That's how skeptical I am. That seems to be fine. Yeah. Skepticism is a virtue, right? So I'm actually exemplifying a good epistemic virtue now here. Okay. Great. So um, what if irrational beliefs 
make people happy? Well, uh, the topic of this session is why do people cling to their irrational beliefs? Why are people not persuaded by science? Well, one possible reason is that actually these beliefs make them happy or they are uh, good for society or whatever. Uh, I call this a skeptic's dilemma. So let's explore what this amounts to. First, as a, uh, by way of introduction, but it's actually already been covered by Massimo, uh, what is a skeptic's job? Well, this is pretty redundant because I'm sitting, I'm standing before a room of skeptics. Uh, skeptics rationally evaluate extraordinary claims. We expose irrational beliefs. We debunk myths. Um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould once compared uh, skepticism to uh, garbage disposal. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a worthy cause that is not often uh, uh, a cause for, uh, uh, for celebration. But, you know, uh, still, it's something worth doing. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. Or in a nutshell, this is more or less what it, uh, what it amounts to. Uh, so this is all pretty familiar. And the default assumption that we skeptics, uh, that we skeptics um, hold is that true beliefs are good. Irrational beliefs uh, are bad because they may be harmful. Uh, truthfulness is important for its own sake as well. Uh, so even if irrational beliefs don't have any immediate uh, harmful effects on society or on individual people, still the, you know, uh, the truth should be defended uh, uh, for its own sake in any event. So the truth might piss you off, as this uh, quote by Gloria Steinem says, the truth uh, will set you free eventually, but first it will piss you off. But even if it pisses you off, just uh, rest assured that eventually it will be all uh, to your own benefit. But what if false beliefs make you happy? What, what should skeptics do in that case? What if some specific pseudoscientific belief has tangible benefits for uh, society, for uh, indiv individual uh, people? Now, you've all heard this common complaints in different, uh, in different uh, varieties and different uh, phrasings. Uh, well, why don't you just leave people alone? Why do you have to take away their illusions? Why, why, why is it be such a spoil sport, uh, be such a sourpuss, whatever, such a cynic? Uh, why, why do you have such a negative attitude? What if it just makes them feel better? Uh, who are you to take away their illusions in any event? You know. Well, here's an interesting response by George Bernard Shaw uh, that I actually kind of like. The fact that a believer is happier than a skeptic is no more to the point than the fact that a drunken man is happier than a sober man. Ta-da! That's all, folks. Well, we can end the discussion now. Back to Massimo, who is uh, eager to, to fill in the rest of the slot anyway. Um, well, okay, not really. Let's take it a little more seriously. Now, although I do have a measure of sympathy for this uh, shark quote, I actually think, well, it's nice and pithy, and it's, and it's kind of funny as well. I'm, uh, too bad that I didn't come up with it. Uh, but um, let's take the idea a little more seriously. Is the truth always better? I love this cartoon. It's one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, what I'm about to tell you is going to change your life forever, says the doctor to Kermit the Frog. Are you really sure you want to know it? <laughs> love this. This is deep in, in so many levels. I often use this when I talk about psychoanalysis as well, because it's this idea that there's something lurking you know, inside of us, some sort of deep unconscious force that is uh, pulling the strings behind the scenes. Anyway, it's not about psychoanalysis today, although this is actually a good example of an irrational belief. But leave that uh, for a minute. So for the sake of the arguments, let's question the default assumption that truth is always better. Uh, what if some false beliefs are actually uh, beneficial? Um, we're going to try to make this as specific as possible. Suppose some specific pseudoscientific beliefs have tangible benefits for the people who endorse them. So what should we do then? Should we shut up? Should we just simply leave it as it is? Uh, worse still, I mean, are we actually harming people if we then take away their illusions and actually make them unhappy? Suppose that we know beforehand that if we take away an illusion, then people will just uh, will be, will, uh, become terribly depressed, let's say. I call this the skeptic's dilemma. Now, at the very least, you can, you can come up with some sort of a borderline case uh, in, in, in the philo philosophical literature, I, I think this is often called the, the, the grandmother's deathbed scenario. Uh, so your grandmother is about to die, and she has a uh, deeply felt belief in the afterlife. She's, she's uh, totally convinced that uh, finally she's going to be reunited with her husband, etc. Um, are you going to debunk the myth of the afterlife right there 
at that point, uh, standing at the deathbed of your grandmother. But you probably won't. It's, uh, it's a comforting illusion at that point. There are no adverse consequences because you know that she's about to die anyway. So if this belief is comforting to her, well, at least you could say that you would be a little bit reluctant to play the hard and uncompromising, unflinching skeptic here. But this is just an extreme scenario. I mean, you wouldn't defend the afterlife, believe in the afterlife in general, would you? I mean, it's one thing to acquiesce in a delusion in a very particular situation, like the grandmother's dead death case. But it's another thing altogether to never to criticize the delusion like the afterlife belief. It's a different thing altogether uh, to foster or to promote that delusion in society. Some people think that belief in afterlife is an existential crutch, that people need this you know, to go about their lives, otherwise they would just, uh, they would collapse. I'm not sure this is, this is true. I mean, uh, it, 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 it's actually, it's something that um, you might grow dependent on after a while if, if you've always uh, believed in the afterlife and suddenly someone takes it away from you, then indeed that might come as a shock. But I don't think that when you, you know, someone who didn't grow up with this belief in the afterlife would probably never miss it. Again, this is a different matter, uh, but I, so the, the point that I want to make here is there's, it's a difference, there's a difference between a very particular situation such, such as a deathbed scenario, uh, where you might be reluctant to play this, uh, the, the, the skeptic or to, to puncture someone's illusion, and um, the idea that some illusions deserve to be defended in, in general. So, um, can we make the same argument for any type of irrational pseudoscientific belief? Should we treat all irrational beliefs alike? And I mean, so we should never promote or foster them, but in highly particular situations, we might actually acquiesce or indulge in people's uh, delusions. Well, I wouldn't say that we should treat all of them alike. I mean, there are obviously differences. Not all of, even if you believe that the truth should always prevail and that uh, an, ir an irrational belief is, uh, is never a good thing, it's always, I mean, even, even in the case of my grandmother, I would still say that it's, uh, that it's a shame that she, you know, that she, uh, that she died while, you know, believing in this, uh, in this myth. Um, I, I would probably accept it at that point, but still, I, 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 would, I would think it's, it's, it's a pity. Um, but not all illusions are equally harmful. Even if you believe that the truth should always prevail, there are still huge differences. So where to focus our attention as, as skeptics? There's so much nonsense to the bank. I mean, you all know this. Uh, there's so little time. So I think we all have a priority list, and I think we, we should have it. I think it's reasonable uh, to have a list of um, priorities when it comes to beliefs or irrational delusions to the bank. Uh, high on top of the list would be things like alternative cancer therapies that, were, uh, that actually be, can, can, can be lethal. Um, climate change denialism, that can lead to a catastrophe in a couple of decades if we don't like... Um, confront the problem of, uh, the very real problem of, um, of climate change, of global warming, uh, anti-vax, uh, campaigning, uh, religious fundamentalism, these things uh, should be high on the priority list. Uh, low down the list, there are things that might be harmful, but when you compare them with those um, beliefs here high on the list, uh, I wouldn't put them on the same par. Um, Massimo, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the name of this place uh, in English, it's, it's unicorn, einhorn. This is the name of this, this venue. Um, it's not on the list, sorry? Oh, right. <laughs> um, but unicorns could be on, on this list as well. I'm not sure if there are people uh, who do live in unicorns except for children. Uh, but if they do, I mean, it's not a belief that is part of a, of a dangerous, uh, you know, irrational doctrine. It's, it's, you can compare it with belief in Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster or fortune cookies. It's, you know, um, as, uh, it's, you, you, you can say about these things what uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy said about the Earth. It's mostly harmless. I wouldn't say it's always harmless, but at least if you compare it with these other beliefs, uh, I, I think I would know where my uh, priorities uh, would lie. Now, can we up the ante? It's one thing to say that beliefs can be relatively harmless. It's another thing to say that they can have net benefits for people. So suppose that 
creationism or astrology or conspiracy theories or whatever have net psychological, social, uh, medical benefits. Now, of course, it's easy to dream up potential benefits. Here are a couple of examples. The guys next door here, the homeopaths, uh, well, you know, they, they feel some relief because of the placebo effect. Uh, people who are superstitious at least have a comforting sense of order and chaos. Uh, people who believe in conspiracy theories, they at least are yearning for explanations as being satisfied. If you believe in Bigfoot, well, what the heck? I mean, it's fun to chase a, you know, a six foot or, a, or a, <laughs> what is it, 10 foot tall uh, giant ape in the Californian forest. So, you know, why should we take that away from people if it makes them happy? Uh, God, well, sure, God provides existential anxiety. The devil, well, you can throw in the devil as well, just to keep people in line. Uh, and guardian angels, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's difficult to have an intimate relationship with a transcendent being like God. So guardian angels or saints might also provide psychological benefits. I mean, you can come up with these psychological explanations very easily. That doesn't mean that they actually make any sense. I think in most cases they don't. So the conclusion here would be, well, why should we fight irrational beliefs in the first place? Are scientific skeptics committing reckless and wanton acts by puncturing so many illusions with complete disregard for their respective benefits? Are we skeptics recidivizing or recidivist party poopers? Now, the problem is, even if you accept that some pseudoscientific beliefs might be beneficial, it's still very much true that most of them are harm harmful. If you believe it, you can fly, for example, you have magic powers, magical powers. Um, I don't have to explain to you in, what, in how many different senses this might actually be dangerous if you have a you know, sincere conviction that you have a magical powers to fly. So how to tell the difference between the beliefs that are dangerous and the beliefs that are um, safe to indulge in? Because the problem is that many irrational beliefs, belief in Bigfoot, for example, versus uh, belief in the protocols of the elders of Zion, I mean the, the, the historicity of this document, have very similar psychological roots. So you might just brush off belief in Bigfoot and say, well, that's, you know, that's harmless, leave people alone. Um, but the problem is that when these beliefs spring from the same root, if you don't tackle them when they are still relatively harmless and innocuous, they might grow uh, more dangerous over time or they might uh, uh, make people more susceptible to uh, more dangerous illusions. Uh, you've heard of these psychological explanations, of course, uh, so things like confirmation bias, different fallacies of reasoning, um, account for a, a, a wide array of different pseudoscientific beliefs. Spurious correlations, for example, I mean, this is probably the wellspring of so many different delusions and, and uh, um, alternative medicine and superstition. Um, shouldn't we just expose these psychological uh, tendencies, uh, these, these, these psychological biases and fallacies, in order to protect people against not, not so much the big food belief, but more the, the harmful kind of delusion? So can we even separate uh, the wheat from the chaff in this uh, context. Because beliefs are levers for action. If you honestly believe that um, you don't have to send your kid to a doctor because, because praying is the only thing that will cure it, if you honestly believe that that's true and that God uh, is, is, uh, is, is expecting this from you as a, as, you know, to, to show your faith that, uh, it's, that, it, that he would be even offended if you would send your kid to the doctor, well, this might actually be uh, very dangerous. So beliefs are not harmless in the sense that when people believe something, they will act on them. And misbeliefs are unpredictable and unruly. They have a tendency to ramify in our worldview, so one belief might lead to the other. Two quick examples. Um, different conspiracy theories are also correlated. This means that when you believe, when you buy into one crazy conspiracy theory, you're more likely to buy into or to have bought into other conspiracy theories. So you might start with something relatively harmless like, oh, I think Elvis is still alive. Well, okay, you're just a laughing stock of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, um, of the company then. But you might end up believing in something that, that is, well, equally crazy, but much more dangerous, like the protocols of the elders of Zion. And I actually know some of these people who started out as just cranks, but they're now hanging out with Holocaust denialists because they think, well, if they you know, are so powerful behind the scenes, if they can pull off X, if they can pull off the moon landing or whatever, if they can pull off uh, the, the, the apparent death of Elvis, well, they can also pull off anything. They can 
uh, they can, they, the Jews or the Illuminati or whoever they are, they, they must be extremely powerful and they, can, they, they, they could have um, uh, staged the Holocaust as well. So there's a slippery slope there. So you might start out with something that is harmless, but you might end up with something that is much more dangerous. The second example, uh, well, the guys next door again. Let's start to whisper that they don't hear us. Actually, no, we shouldn't whisper because uh, I actually want them to hear about this. Um, I wrote a, a little piece in, in, in a Dutch newspaper here that some of you might have read in uh, NRC or NRC, uh, Handelsblad. Uh, <laughs> right? It's, so it's a Dutch newspaper and it's, it's, it's a piece about homeopathy. Uh, and I responded to a claim by, uh, and this, 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 uh, Researcher might actually be in the room here, but I, because I saw that he's on the on the schedule for later to, uh, this afternoon. Jan Peter Margri, is he here? Or not yet? Oh, there he is. Well, this might be uh, interesting later on. But so you, uh, there was an interview in, NR, uh, in NRC um, a couple of a couple of weeks ago, where um, uh, so my colleague did this seemingly reasonable suggestion that not all alternative uh, therapies are, uh, are, are equally harm, uh, harmful. So some forms of homeopathy might actually uh, you know, have beneficial effects without harming people. And even though this might be true, I mean, there's nothing more uh, innocuous than homeopathy in a sense because it's just water, it's just sugar pills, it doesn't do anything. And the argument I was making is that it's not so much homeopathy that is dangerous, it's the belief that it works that is dangerous. So this is actually that, uh, the, the, the thing that we, should be, um, uh, that we should be worried about because um, an undercover uh, investigation by uh, Simon Singh in the UK, and this has been repeated in, in Belgium and the Netherlands as well, shows that uh, a, a very high percentage of homeopaths would uh, give people a prophylactic against malaria, for example, as, a, as an alternative for, uh, for real medicine. Now, this, is, this, this, this can be life-threatening. And it's very hard to tell people, well, okay, you can take homeopathic pills for, for a cold or for a common flu, but you should never take them uh, uh, against malaria. I mean, if people believe, if they work for the, for the flu and for, for the cold, there must be some sort of you know, principle there that is, actually, that is actually working. Why should we stop there? Why shouldn't we uh, accept that it works across the board? So illusions might have dangerous effects, not directly, but downstream, indirectly, um, later on. So that was what I, was, I was arguing in the, in the NRC piece. Now I, I was decided to sneak in a slide about virgin epistemology just to see if Massimo would agree. But uh, I think I could make the, the, the same points in terms of, of virtues. Mm. So um, on the right side of Massimo's list we saw these vices, self-deception, uh, self wishful thinking, I think gullibility was on there as well but I'm not sure. Um, so even though in particular cases it might be true that um, you would be better off self-deceived about something or you might uh, be happier if you indulge in a little bit of wishful thinking. That doesn't mean that the general tendency for wishful thinking or for self-deception is safe to indulge in or that it's something to, to celebrate or to promote or to cultivate. It's still a vice. You can come up with any kind of crazy... If I believe that my plane is leaving at 8 a.m. in the morning and it's actually leaving at uh, 7 a.m. already, uh, but as it happens, uh, there's a terrorist on the plane and the plane explodes in midair, so I miss my flight, uh, then my misbelief that the flight was uh, leaving an hour later was actually beneficial because it saved my life. Because, of course, this is a very uh, far-fetched and contrived situation. You have to... It's not... It's always easy to come up with some specific scenario where a misbelief might be helpful, but we're uh, looking for a general tendency. It's not just that self -deceive, being self-deceived might sometimes make you happy. Uh, the question is, if self is self-deception in general uh, something that you should cultivate as a virtue or as a device? The following tale of alien encounters is true, and by true I mean false. It's all lies, but they're entertaining lies, and in the end, isn't that the real truth? The answer is no. So, of course, they're entertaining falsehoods. But can we willfully believe entertaining lies? Can we say, oh, well, I'm going to indulge in a little bit of wishful thinking here because all things considered, this seems to be pretty safe and harmless and even beneficial, but I'm not going to uh, indulge in wishful thinking when it, when it really matters. I mean, this, this, this is along the lines of the, of the suggestion by my colleague, by uh, uh, Professor Margi. So, um, can't we just 
make a distinction between safe illusions and dangerous delusions? Well, there's something called uh, the doxastic catch-22. Uh, that's some, uh, a term that I uh, came up with in my, my latest book. Um, and this arises from a doctrine that has a very pretentious uh, or like a pedantic name in philosophy. It's called doxastic involuntarism. And uh, what it comes down to is that we don't choose our beliefs. We, can't, we cannot willfully or voluntarily adopt a belief. It's, if anything, they impose themselves upon us. By the way, doxastic is just fancy philosoph philosophy's jargon for relating to belief. So there's not a, a, a switch in your brain that you can just flip and say, oh, wouldn't it be great if I believed in God because it would make me so happy. Even as a skeptic, even if someone would be uh, convinced by that argument that uh, believing God would, uh, would offer uh, solace, would offer uh, you know, uh, relief from my existential anxiety, I still wouldn't be able to do it. There's a nice Woody Allen movie about this, actually, where Woody, or Woody Car uh, Woody's character decides to become a Catholic, and he goes to a priest, and he's like, oh, this is so great, and I love the tradition, and the buildings, and the, oh, the rituals, and, and I want to become a Catholic, but there's one tiny problem. I don't believe any of it. <laughs> and so then, and he asks the priest, well, what should I do? I mean, should I just, you know, uh, genuflect, and, and just do the prayers, or should I just dye some Easter eggs, or whatever? Um, Anything, anything that, that, that you want me to do, I'll, I'll do it, but it's just, you know, I can't just decide to believe something. The philosopher Blaise Pascal actually had a solution for that, so the genuflecting thing uh, is actually uh, a serious point. Uh, Blaise Pascal said, if you're a skeptic and you want to believe, just go to church, go to the motions, uh, go to the confession box, whatever, uh, kneel down, do whatever the hell they expect you to do, and at some point it will just creep up on you. You'll suddenly become a Catholic. But even then, it's more like it's, it's, it's indirect self-manipulation rather than just snapping your fingers and deciding, now I'm going to believe in God. Uh, how many minutes do I have left? Or five. five. That is, that's perfect. Um, why is it called the Catch-22? Well, of course, uh, uh, this derived from uh, the famous novel by Joseph Heller. Catch-22 is one of my favorite novels. Um, it's set in the Second World War, and um, the main, the protagonist, uh, Yossarian, is uh, is a pilot, and in his uh, in his squadron or whatever that is called, um, everyone has to do compulsory missions, so flying missions. That is, everyone, except the people who are crazy. So you have to do it, unless you're crazy, then you can get off the hook. If you're prepared to fly, of course, you know, if, you could, if you're prepared to do what amounts to a suicidal mission, because these flights are really dangerous, then, I mean, you have to be barking mad to be able to, 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 to want to do something out of your own will. So if you're prepared to fly, you don't have to, because you're mad. On the other hand, if you want to fly, if you say, yeah, sure, just uh, bring me that plane and let me, uh, let's kill off some Germans then you're quite sane indeed. Because any sane person wouldn't want to fly. Uh, so wait, wait, am I getting confused now? So if you don't want to fly, now this is, this is a paradox, so okay. Uh, if you don't want to fly, you're quite sane indeed, and that's exactly why you have to fly, because you're sane. If you don't want to fly, you're, you're barking mad, and that's why you don't have to fly. So, to summarize the point, if he flew, then he was crazy and didn't have to, but if he didn't want to, he was sane and he had to. I think there's a similar catch-22 when it comes to misbeliefs. This is a huge chunk of text, but I'm just going to read it. Uh, so this is, this is also from my, uh, from my book or from the uh, translation. In order to know which illusions are useful, you have to investigate the attendant pros and cons. But if you've done that, you can no longer sincerely, sincerely believe in them. So you're unable to reap the advantages. D alleged benefits. A person who sincerely cherishes an illusion has no reason to wonder whether that particular belief is good for his or her health. We acquire beliefs simply because we honestly take them to be true, not because we think they are useful or comforting or good for our blood pressure or whatever. That's just not something that, uh, that occurs to people who sincerely endorse a belief. 
An illusion will make you happy only if you're unaware of being under its spell. But in that case, you can't possibly possess knowledge about whether or not your illusion is useful or dangerous. To do that, you would have to measure up your illusions to reality and check if you're believing that particular illusion might get you into trouble. If I believe that I can fly, will this get me into trouble if I jump off a, a skyscraper? Well, yeah, it might. But in order to know that, you have to be, you have to, you know, do a reality check. But you can't do that if you're sincerely convinced that you can fly. But once you've figured that out, you have already punctured your illusion. So it's the same, it's, a, it's, it's I think there's an analogy here with the original Luxastic uh, Catch-22 uh, in that if you buy into these illusions, uh, you can no longer judge if they're safe or harmful. So you have to investigate that. But as soon as you investigate that, you can no longer endorse them. So you're in a bind. So what's the take home message for skeptics? I think it's okay to prioritize. We shouldn't obsess too much over easy target, targets such as big food or unicorns, except I think as a, um, for pedagogical purposes. We, sometimes it might be useful to point out reasoning flaws and errors uh, when it comes to Bigfoot, because at least that's something that everyone can agree on. There are not a lot of Bigfoot believers around. You can explain something about confirmation bias and the uh, fallibility of, uh, of perception, etc., by just taking a simple example like uh, Bigfoot. But we should focus on harmful cases, even, even if not... Uh, even if uh, we don't accept the argument that irrational beliefs are beneficial, um, we, we should still, I think, um, accept that not all of them are equally harmful. But we should not accept the paternalistic reply that, well, okay, if it makes them feel better, what's the harm? Don't we all need comforting illusions? Why take it away from them? I wouldn't do that. Or I wouldn't advise you to do that either. Um, because illusions are potentially dangerous, even if they are seemingly innocuous, because they ramify in our worldview. One illusion leads to the next, because people make inferences, they, make, you know, they derive logical consequences from their beliefs, and they might end up in a situation where it actually becomes dangerous. Remember the thing about conspiracy theories? You start believing that Elvis is still alive, ha ha ha, uh, and then you end up believing that uh, there really was uh, such a cattle uh, conference called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and you end up believing that the Holocaust is fake. Never happened. So beliefs have, or misbeliefs have adverse side effects because of these ramifications in our worldview. And the second reason why um, we should still fight irrationality is that not just have illusions side effects because they lead to other illusions, but, all, but even if they don't have even if they don't lead to other illusions, it's still the case that different false beliefs spring from similar roots and causes. Biases, fallacies, Massimo would say epistemic vices. Once you have this epistemic vice that leads you to believe in Bigfoot because you're gullible, for example, well, this will set you up for a lot of other illusions as well that are much less harmless than uh, belief in Bigfoot. Um, so I have uh, written more about this in uh, my book, it's in Dutch. Uh, not just about pseudoscientific forms of irrationality, but also about more uh, personal illusions. I haven't talked about this today, but um, apart from illusions or misbeliefs that we might have about the universe or about the human condition or about the world in general, we can also have more personal illusions about our own talents and capacities. And actually, it, it, it turns out that many people are uh, susceptible to these illusions. There's a huge psychological literature on something called positive illusions, excessive optimism, illusion of control that we have, the, the, thing, uh, the idea that we control our environment and uh, our um, wanton uh, overconfidence. This is something that, so the existence of these illusions uh, has been amply demonstrated, but the question again, of course, is are these illusions beneficial or might they uh, be harmful? This is a question that I try to um, answer in my book, and I also try to find ways out of this uh, doxastic catch-22 paternalism. Uh, paternalism is one example where you say, okay, well, um, I can't choose my own misbeliefs, but perhaps someone else can do that on my behalf. Like my doctor can say, 
you can take this homeopathic pill against the flu, but no, 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 not against malaria. It was because, you know, just <laughs> don't ask questions, just trust me that this is not going to work this time. Um, and this might, this might help because then there's someone out there who does this reality check and who makes sure that these uh, misbeliefs don't have any adverse consequences. But then I think very, very broadly that we end up with a moral problem. Uh, I don't think that this is uh, something that we can still accept nowadays uh, in, um, uh, in modern me uh, medical practice. And that is a, another solution that is also uh, quite interesting. Some people uh, believe that we can put uh, trust in, let's call it the wisdom of evolution. Uh, so this, it's this idea that uh, evolution has um, saddled us with a number of delusions or misbeliefs, but uh, these beliefs are adaptive because they have fitness benefits. I think the problem there, uh, uh, very quickly, is that evolution does not really care about us. Even if there are uh, adaptive misbeliefs, some, uh, it's not because a belief is adaptive that, uh, that it will actually make you happy. What evolution cares about is spreading genes, etc. I mean, that's what it's often... Um, uh, at least that's, that's how people mostly think about uh, evolution in terms of the, uh, the, the genes uh, eye point of view. I think that's a useful uh, heuristic to think about it. But if evolution happens in the interest of the genes, that doesn't actually ensure that you, um, uh, that it will be uh, to your benefit. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to translate uh, the title here. Two suggestions perhaps. Uh, people can tell me what, uh, if they have a better suggestion or which one is, is, is the best out of two. Uh, illusions for the advanced, why truth is always better, that's a literal translation, uh, or something like seeking untruth, the quest for positive illusions. I think the book might be on sale here, but I'm not sure, so there was uh, some uh, talk about that. Yeah, I see someone pointing at the, <laughs> at the book stall uh, at the back. So it actually, it seems to be on sale. So I think this is the last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Mark. Martin Boudry dance here. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Please stay on stage and take yeah. a chair. Uh, and Massimo, would you please come up as well? Yes. Um, to briefly, although we have a quarter of an hour, I guess, uh, discuss some of the issues. Um, you, you seem to be quite on the same level and lines, but there, there must be some discrepancies. Um, so perhaps, right? uh, since you've had the last word, I'll go to Massimo first. And um, did you have any objections or comments on what uh, yeah, Martin I'm not, I'm is not telling sure. us? Yeah, I'm not sure that I have objections. This was the first time I saw uh, Martin's talk, by the way, so I'm just speaking out of, you know, off the cuff, so to speak. No, not, not really. <laughs> but uh, no, I don't think I have objections as much as maybe a couple of qualifications uh, or questions, actually, for him. So, so for instance, you, know, you mentioned a couple of times these interesting uh, situations where, you know, your grandmother is on the deathbed and you yeah. really want to convince her that there is no afterlife. I actually have been in that situation. You know, right. And no, I did not even think about uh, doing that. That, to me, is a reflection of wisdom. Yeah. Right? So you have to, you have to have, wisdom is the ability to decide whether you want to act one way or the other depending on the circumstances. Uh, which, and of course, that's a fundamental virtue, right? Um, then you're also saying uh, the ability to prioritize, for instance. So, yeah. so certain things are, as you pointed out, there's only so much time and there's a lot of nonsense out there. Uh, so you definitely do want pri to prioritize. There are indeed things that are more important than, than, than others. And, um, the ability to prioritize is, is uh, referred to in virtue epistemology as you know, practical wisdom or prudence. So it's, it's the ability to say, well, it's a complicated thing. Now let me start where I can actually do the most good as opposed to other situations. One thing that I wanted to ask you, because we may disagree on this a little bit, but may, maybe not, I don't know. You, you said that beliefs impose themselves on mm -hmm. us. And to some extent, I think that's true. In fact, there is a significant amount of evidence from modern cognitive science yeah. that that is the case. But one of the things that is becoming uh, uh, annoying for me in the last few years is that I've seen this um, uh, fashion, in, uh, uh, even among skeptics, but, uh, but certainly among some scientists who are popular in the skeptic community. For instance, Jonathan Haidt, the, the cognitive yeah. scientist, the social sci uh, scientist, who basically are going so far with that line of argument as to say that really we don't hold any rational beliefs. We, we, we rationalize all the time. It's, it's, you know, consciousness is an illusion. Yeah. Uh, rational thought is an illusion. It all comes out of the guts and, 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 the, and the underbelly, so to speak, of, of your brain. 
So that seems to me to go overboard. That is, it's one yeah. thing to be right, aware of the cognitive biases, aware of the fact that, yes, maybe we indulge much more often than we think of in rationalization. But if you really want to go all the way, like Jonathan sometimes at least seems to, depending on the circumstances, seems to do, then one would have to start questioning the very idea of rationality and therefore the very idea of science. Then, then why should I believe Jonathan Haidt and why not think that he's also rationalizing, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. it tends to become self undermining. Uh, I, I completely agree on that count. Um, actually, there's a very nice essay by Paul Bloom that I recently reread. Uh, I think it's called uh, The War on Reason or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and he also points out that, look, um, there's a negative slant in much, in much of this uh, social psychology uh, research uh, where people are often depicted as just, you know, irrational and stupid and they only follow their gut instincts or whatever. Uh, but, uh, so, Paul Bloom paints a more positive picture where, of course, it is true that uh, sure. uh, reasoning has an emotional dimension and sometimes people are swayed by, uh, by, by, by emotion or by passion more uh, uh, than, than by reason. Uh, but, look, um, I mean, the very fact that we can point out these uh, biases and fallacies, and uh, people like Jonathan Haidt or Daniel Kahneman uh, can write books about them, knows, uh, 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 demonstrates that we're not completely uh, helpless, that uh, we can escape from them, and we can rationally point out what's, what's, what's wrong with them and how to, how to cope with them, how perhaps to, uh, uh, to prevent them from occurring as much as possible. Now, um, coming back to the point about... Uh, about beliefs imposing themselves upon us. I do insist on that point, but I think there might be a misunderstanding because I don't think it's, a, it's the same idea as, as a thing you rightly object to. Okay. Um, I think even the nicest demonstration of this principle of, I'm gonna say it again because I love it, uh, doxastic involuntarism, uh, is Philo that- Philosophers yeah. <laughs> just love big I words. Just, yeah, love yeah. right. <laughs> is um, a mathematical proof, for example, something that is Sure. Completely irrational. If you read through uh, the proof of why uh, the angles of a, of a triangle have to measure up to 180 degrees, for example, or let's say uh, P uh, Pythagoras' theorem. Mm -hmm. um, so if, you know, uh, you all know, so I don't have to explain it to you. But if you follow uh, and if you the don't reasoning know, you can look step, it up. yeah, you have to look it up. <laughs> and actually, this might be interesting. If there's someone in the room who doesn't know it, um, so... Uh, Make your the hypotenuse is the, is, is the, right, exactly. Uh, so, no okay, math. I'm not, I'm not going to explain the, the thing. But if you go look it up uh, and you, you follow just the, the chain of reasoning, it, it's just so rationally compelling that you have no choice but to accept right. it. And that's actually a good thing because we, right. we, we don't want to choose our own beliefs. It would be a very, um, in this case, fitness uh, diminishing or fitness lowering right. uh, tendency if we could choose our own beliefs. Um, some philosophers, and I tend to agree with them, like Jonathan Adler, even argue that this principle of uh, 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 doxastic involuntarism, again, uh, is, actually, is a conceptual truth about belief. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have a mental state that you can choose yourself, then it cannot possibly be belief. Belief is something that uh, imposes right. itself upon you. If you're standing in front of a tiger that, who's uh, about to, you know, to, 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 to pounce on you, it's obviously a very comforting idea that, oh, this is just, it's just a stuffed animal or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but if we could choose our own beliefs, that's obviously what we would do because it would be comforting, but that wouldn't be a very, you know, a very uh, good strategy. So I, I agree with you that we should not uh, oversell the, 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 the irrationality or the, uh, the, 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 the emotional, uh, uh, what's it, the, the, uh, the gut feeling or the gut instinct kind of reasoning. Uh, but I think actually it's, it's the other way around. It's exactly the rational arguments that are, that are, that are most, uh, most compelling, that are imposed themselves on us in, in, in the strongest possible sense. Which brings okay, me can to... I, can I Sorry, yeah. just interfere a bit? Um, uh, you, you talk about uh, beliefs imposing themselves, yeah. themselves. But isn't it true that our, our society is full of of uh, powers trying to indoctrinate us with all kinds of beliefs, uh, whether it's commercial yeah. or philosophical or theological, I don't know, but you're not alone in this. That is true. Well, it's a figure of speech, of course. Beliefs don't have any powers. Uh, I know that Mother is always right. suspicious of, of, of memes. It's not as if they, they are in control of us or whatever. But it's, it's the fact that 
when you're exposed to certain evidence, or let's say even to someone who's trying to manipulate you, right. uh, let's say a state official who, who, who's just trying to you know, indoctrinate you in, in, into a particular uh, ideology, uh, if those arguments for whatever reason are, rationally, are either rationally compelling or seem to be rationally compelling, because the propaganda is so successful, yeah. then you have no choice but to accept them. Uh, but, but you don't need someone who is imposing, who is trying to impose a belief on you in order to, uh, for beliefs to be rationally compelling. So, for example, if I just open my eyes and I see this glass standing right in front of me, then I have no choice but to accept it. So, as a figure of speech, you could say the glass itself or the belief is imposing itself uh, upon me and I, I have no choice but to, to just, you know, uh, embrace it. Right. Okay. I would like to believe that this is vodka, but it isn't. No, that's right. <laughs> that would be so great. Yeah, even a bottle is suggesting <laughs> right? it, but it's not. And it doesn't even have to be vodka. But I have it's one just more. a placebo effect. <laughs> okay, okay Massimo, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to... Uh, so that brings me actually to another point. I, I thought your, your point toward the end was very good and needs to be stressed. That You said that even if somebody is delusional, you know, if, if he subscribes to a, to a belief that it's in fact not true or we, we, we have very good reasons to think that it's not true. That person does su subscribe to that belief because she thinks it is in fact true. Yeah. Right? That is, nobody wants to be wrong. Exactly. You know, the people don't get up in the morning and say, yes, what kind of wrong notion could I possibly endorse today, right? Yeah. We want to be right, which to me implies that this idea of well, let people believe in illusions because they're good for them is incredibly condescending. Exactly. Right? And it's non-virtuous in the sense that you're using another human being. You're, you're, simply, you're simply not respecting that person as a human being. That, that person is a human being, even though he's mistaken about that, or he may be mistaken about that particular belief. Uh, you still have a right to take I mean, uh, sorry, a duty to take seriously the idea that he believes it. He really wants it to be true. Yeah. And in fact, if told, and th there are experiments about this, if people are told, you know, would you, would you rather spend your life in a sort of a machine of illusions where everything is great, and, but, but it is an illusion. It's Robert Nozick. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nozick's uh, uh, thought experiment yeah. um, uh, many years ago, and of course, the Matrix. The sure. red pill or the yeah. blue pill, right? As it turns out, most people would, would choose the red pill. They rather have a harsh deal with a harsh reality exactly. if they notice the truth. It's an important point. Yeah. Than, uh, than uh, engage in illusion willfully. So yeah. it's, it's disrespectful to other people, I think, to say and condescending to say, oh, yeah, let them do, the, yeah, do their exactly. illusion. Yeah, exactly. Nobody... Uh, exa well, actually, I think this, this, this can be inferred from the the earlier point about uh, doxastic involuntarism, that uh, <laughs> nobody willfully adopts a wrong belief. Everyone cares about authenticity. Right. Everyone is, 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 is convinced by definition that the beliefs that they hold are true. Right. And they, uh, if, uh, for example, and this is the interesting thing about uh, having this discussion about positive or beneficial illusions, that you can actually have a, an agreement on, on a meta level, let's say with, an, uh, uh, with a religious believer. I sure. can have a discussion with a religious believer and ask, sure. no, just bracket the question of the existence of God for a second. Let's just, just ignore that. But whatever the truth is, would you agree that you want to know it? I mean, I, for one, would, would want to know if God exists. Perhaps exactly. if, if there is a God, uh, especially if there is an afterlife you yes. know, attached to the deal, then that's probably the, the most important truth about the universe that you can possibly know because it's an eternity. Uh, so I would definitely want to know about that. And uh, a religious believer, from his point of view, from her point, point of view, might agree that, oh, yeah, sure, I, do want, I want to know the truth as well. If God does not exist, I, I would rather be in the knowing, you know. So, um, so that's interesting if, if you have a discussion about beneficial illusions that you can sidestep some of the substantial uh, disagreements that you have with, with pseudoscientists or with skeptics or uh, whatever. So there are a few people who would say, no, I don't care about the truth, I'm completely indifferent. Uh, that's, that's very rare. And even if they do say it, I don't think... They believe it. They believe yeah. it, because right. uh, the, the Nazi uh, exper uh, thought experiment with the experience machine actually shows that few people um, would be willing to step into the machine. And I think even the people who say that they want to step into the machine will not live up to their, uh, <laughs> to their resolve when if, push comes to show. Offered, if offered, if, if offered the choice. Yes. Uh, I, I want to say uh, one more thing, but I kind of... Uh, so you made a point about... Uh, the experience the disrespect. Uh, oh, yeah, the yeah. disrespect, exactly. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's... Uh, I mean, please repeat. The very quickly. First. Many people point out to skeptics, oh, it's so disrespectful of you yeah. to attack people's illusions. Uh, why can't you just uh, 
accept that they have a different uh, belief from you, why do you have to take away their illusions? But you're right, it's exactly the other way around. It shows much more respect if you take someone seriously, rather than just be in a condescending way, say, oh yeah, sure, God exists or unicorns exist. I mean, if, if, right. if it makes you happy, that's condescending because you're not taking someone seriously as a person. Exactly. That's, that's the way we treat and children one, who one of the in virtues Santa Claus. you should follow is trying to be honest with people. Isn't exactly, it? yes. Yes, that leads me to my final question and then we go to the audience. Um, why exactly is this whole discussion and debate about skepticism uh, framed, especially by your, your talk, in, in the domain of virtues? Why is that so important? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it doesn't have to be framed that way, right? And there, there are different ways of looking at the same problem. Uh, but I think that virtual ethics in general has uh, is a particularly powerful approach and particularly useful for skeptics because it puts the emphasis on the, uh, on the duty of the individual, in this case, the intellectual duties of the individual. Right. So if you ask yourself, you know, am I a good person uh -huh. in general, then the answer is, comes out of, well, do I, you know, value justice and truth and, you know, and am I courageous about, you know, taking, standing up for people and that sort of stuff? If the answer is yes, then yeah, you're a pretty good person. Similarly, from an epistemological perspective, if you ask yourself, you know, regardless of what anybody else is doing, you know, do I approach these things with humility and, you know, with curiosity, open-mindedness, et cetera, et cetera, then if the answer is yes, uh, you, you're doing the right thing. So. The advantage of a virtual ethical approach is that it puts the, the uh, emphasis and the onus on the individual. You can ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? Right, I see. Um, would you say skeptics in general are as virtuous as you would like them to be? No. <laughs> I thought so. But that includes me, so, me too. So it's I not, think we'll have a lot of discussion during lunch, etc. Can um, I quickly ask, say something in uh, yeah, sure. on that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, and because, then we'll uh, go to the audience. Um, well, one thing I wanted to ask you, but that's for later on, do you think that there may be changing epistemic values, um, for virtues, uh, sorry? So, for example, many people value consistency and staunchness and having resolve, right. um, where, and, and they, somebody who changes his mind, for example, is just uh, dismissed as yeah. spineless and right. wishy-washy and wavering, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, especially in politics, for example, do you think there, uh, th there's a different set of epistemic values when it comes to politics and when it comes to science or philosophy. And uh, the other point uh, that I w uh, wanted to raise that to very quickly uh, again <laughs> is that uh, one of the reasons why, why some skeptics might be less virtuous than we would, uh, than we would hope, and I, I plead guilty in that, uh, on that count as well, is that being right about something, about homeopathy for example, sometimes tends to corrupt. Yes. Because right. you can be so complacent about it, you can just lean back and say, right. you know, whatever you're going to throw at me, I mean, right. okay, <laughs> water doesn't have a memory, so, and, and it makes you le complacent about it in the sense that you, you, you don't really care about finding the very best argument because you can afford to ignore that's right. uh, part that of was, the argument. And was, there uh, I will stop, sorry. Okay. That was, that was <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's true. I mean, that was Fay Rabbit's point about uh, Paul Kurtz's uh, list. Yeah. Uh, it's, like, it's not that they're wrong factually, it's just they're wrong as a matter of attitude, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, so the first question was about politics. I actually do think that all uh, uh, human activities can fall under the edges of, of virtue, uh, virtue ethics. So no, you can be, and you should be a virtuous politician. Uh, and that means that you have respect for the truth and that sort of stuff. You also, of course, have to be pragmatic if you're a politician. So, you know, practical wisdom comes into place, but not at the expense of, of you know, basically bullshitting people all yeah. over. Um, in terms of... Um, you know, uh, virtue for skeptics, uh, you're right, it's the temptation is very easy to just slide into these kind of, you know, oh, well, I have the preconceived, uh, you know, prepackaged answer, I'm just going to give it to you. Look, the idea here is not that, um, that you should beat yourself up because, oh my gosh, I'm not virtuous enough, and, you know, Massimo told me I'm not virtuous, or now well, I'm going to hell, skeptic hell, or something like <laughs> that, right? That's not the point. I'm not the sure point. it exists. Right, yeah. <laughs> the point is, is, is to help ourselves. Again, the focus is on the individual, right? So you're not supposed to be going out beating other people up with, uh, oh, you're not virtuous enough, but rather or look yourself, in the mirror and say, wait a like minute, a, am I virtuous yeah. enough? And if right, not, right. maybe I want to improve. Okay, we have some questions uh, even on the screen. Oh, uh, wow. Like, like we uh, promised. And it seems to be working. That's, that's one good point. Um, let me read it out. In the media, the answer, we don't know, is regarded as a weak statement, and the opposite story is regarded as true. What should we do in such a case? 
Um, you want to go first? Which right. Two? Um, yeah, I think I, I have a, I have a hunch that our answer would be, will be along the same lines. But now, so yeah, ign um, it's okay to be ignorant. It's okay not to know. And, and I, I completely agree with the with this question that um, sometimes, as I said, I mean. Admitting that you don't know something is seen as a, as a lack of resolve or it's just or as insecurity or whatever Whereas no, it's 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 actually some sort of meta knowledge. You you do know something you know that there's some domain in your uh, range of knowledge that you're not uh, that you haven't explored yet uh, so and it's important to admit that uh, and to uh, because then you're at least open to discovering something new so it, that, that's what the question amounts yeah, to right? I think that, so. Yeah. So it's it, it's important to admit that we don't, and we that, and that is perhaps a, a change in uh, in epistemic virtues that we have to uh, that we have to promote but because it's right. Many people think that it's a kind of a, a weak bit or it's an admission of defeat when you say, oh, I don't know. Ha, huh, you don't know. So then let's let's listen to the other guy who at least sure. professes but to know everything. exactly yeah. professes. <laughs> to know. But but that that goes back. This is something new, right? It goes back to 2,400 years. You know, Socrates famously was told by the Oracle of Delphi that he was the wisest man in Greece. And it turns exactly. out that that was the case because he was the one that, did, that knew that he didn't know stuff, right? Yeah. While uh -huh. everybody else pretended to. So I think the answer to the question is you just have to sit down and explain it to the media. Uh, you know, whenever I do a media interview these days, you know, initially, uh, the first time you get into this kind of business and you know, the, the New York Times calls you up or, or even the local newspaper calls you up, you say, oh wow, this is exciting, then they want to know what I think. Then you get over it because you, you realize <laughs> how many times they misrepresent what you're saying, you know, that sort of stuff. So now very often, for instance, I, I, I only accept interviews if they're via email and so that I actually have time to write down carefully what I want to say. Yeah. And I try, I try to vet the, stu the stuff they don't like that. No, they don't like that. it. <laughs> they don't like it because it slows them down, right? Exactly. And they want to catch you off guard. Like they want to, of course. to, to talk to you on the phone and, and, you know, until you have a slip of the tongue or whatever. And then, and then they say, ha, right. what an but ignoramus. One practical this, thing of course, is a character, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, you one yeah. <laughs> there's one practical thing you can do when you are in that kind of situation, right? So when, you, when, you, when the best thing to say is, oh, sorry, but I don't know this, and you think that actually nobody knows, you could add and say, and by the way, don't believe anybody who tells you that they do because they don't. Okay. Yeah. Right? Well, and so you, that becomes a soundbite that the journalists can actually use. For bizarre. starters, you could say, we don't know. Sure. We, ex exactly. You know, we don't know. Science doesn't know. Yeah. Aha, but there is something beyond science. So you know more than Socrates. <laughs> the only thing that Socrates knew that was that he didn't know anything, whereas you know that you don't know anything, and, and neither does anyone else. <laughs> right. do other people. Okay, guys, there's another question. I, I forgot to ask who put the question in the first place. Who was the first uh, person to ask the question? Okay, thank you so much. Oh, that's a new question. Oh, that's a new that's question a new as well, question. on paper. Uh, let's go to the second one first. Can um, we live without any illusion? Can we live yeah. without any illusion? Well, actually, that's, that's, the, that's a, the question that my, my book starts with, like... Uh, can we live without delusion, or is this, this notion that we can live without delusion the biggest delusion of all? Um, the biggest, yeah. Uh, so, well, the subtitle of, of, of my book is kind of a giveaway. Uh, I think that the truth is always better. Uh, I think you can, you can uh, interpret this question in two ways. As a matter of fact, I think it's impossible to live without illusion, illusions because we're not omniscient. We don't know, know right. everything. Uh, we have inevitably, because we we have we we, we um, develop so many different beliefs about so many different things that we're bound to be mistaken in some regards. Uh, it would be a, a huge coincidence if if all of my beliefs, even all the the things that I wrote in the book or the things that we that we just uh, explained here on the stage, if all of them would be would be true. So as a matter of fact, I think it's impossible. But. The, the, the second way to interpret the question is, do we, do we have a psychological or uh, existential needs for illusion? Yeah. Is, 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 would we, would we uh, you know, just fall into a depression if the very last illusion was taken away from us? I don't think that's the case. I think, I don't see any, I don't think that we have to believe in the afterlife. I don't think that we have to be excessively uh, uh, overconfident, for example, or that we have to be uh, more optimistic than, uh, than the facts uh, justify. Uh, on the opposite, uh, I think that might actually be dangerous. So, yeah, if, if you interpret the question in a second way, no, I don't think we need any illusion. And actually, there, there is some empirical, interesting empirical <laughs> evidence about, you know, 
people often, especially in the last few years, they, the, the positive psychologists tell you that it's, you know, it's important to think positively about stuff and be optimistic about stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But actually, there is a significant amount of evidence in the empirical literature that says that the pessimists are the ones that actually have better lives. Uh, and the pessimists are actually those that, that have fewer illusions and look at reality a little bit more carefully. Yeah. Uh, because what, what that does is they, have, they lower their expectations. Right? And so they are far less disappointed than people who tend to be optimistic and <laughs> have illusions about what they can do and what they cannot do. They're so I should please because just whatever happens to them is like, oh, it's better than I expected. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right, right. So never expect anything. Oh, yeah, you know, my, so okay, I have a final question yeah. on paper, like I said. I'm, I'm not sure. Did, did we have any more on, on screen? Or? Lots. Okay. Yeah, well, we can't do them all. That's, and you made a choice, not or we me. can try to do them like very quickly with a... With a three-word responders. Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't have much time. Uh, first, I'd like to, to do this one for, uh, for a second. Uh, uh, f from uh, Mrs. Schneiderbost over there. Um, isn't it the nastiest illusion among human beings that from birth on, men believe they are entitled to all the better things in life, including services of women, because they are better human beings than women? Including one of, of the, the services, okay. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, it, it's, that, that is definitely an illusion. Happily, I think... Wait, it, it's, what? <laughs> <laughs> sorry to break it to it's you. It's all new to talk about. No, it's an illusion, but uh, happily, I'm, I'm kind of an, uh, I'm, I'm an optimist, or at least I, I believe in, in moral progress. I do think that it's an, illu an illusion that is, uh, that is losing its hold on... On humanity, so the could, male, you, the male you, half you, of humanity. You've yeah. heard of a guy named Donald Trump, right? I, I did, yeah. but I'm pretty. You, you, you okay. do know that he's going to be voted by 40 percent. Could we? I, I think <laughs> I'm pretty confident that. I'm, I mean, I would want. Would you want to make a bet, or you, you think that he's going to? Well, no, no, no. He's not going to. I'm pretty. Yeah, I'm pretty confident he's, he's, gonna he's not going to win. No, but it's, it's too bad enough that he already. No, all I'm saying that is part, that yeah. yes, yeah. I, of course, I agree that that is an illusion, and it's a very pernicious one. There is yeah. a number of pernicious illusions. Yeah, the sexism, you mean? Yeah, the sexism, yeah. right? But there is a number of pernicious illusions actually that skeptics don't deal with uh, that too was, much. The point I was trying right? to raise actually isn't feminism a kind of skepticism? Uh, gosh, that's gonna, we have one. And this, two hours, this right? <laughs> and this calls for a new working group right. in skepticism. So, so there is an interesting question. So not only I think that we don't talk enough about the illusion that men are superior to women, we also don't talk enough about the illusion that a particular ethnic uh, uh, race or group is right. superior or inferior to another one. In fact, it kind of is disturbing that occasion you see in skeptic magazines uh, you know, articles about racial uh, differences and superiorities that are actually not uh, based on, on reliable science. Um, so, th so that's a very good question that gets into the social uh, part of social activism of, of skepticism. Now, and it should be done more. Now, that said, feminism, however, first of all, it, it, there's a variety of different types of fem feminism. It's a family of positions, not just one. Right. Right? It starts with the very basic idea that women have e should have equal rights to men. That's, I think, the kind of feminism where almost everybody can get on board, except for Donald Trump. Um, but then there are other versions of feminists that get more and more sort of radical or specific about what they're, saying, what they're doing. So I wouldn't go as far as saying that skeptics should be feminist in any of these other ways. Uh, they should just look at the facts and say, yeah, there right. is no reason to believe that there is any biological difference, you know, that it that makes any sense. I mean, there are some obvious biological differences, like, you know, I don't have breasts. <laughs> um, but at a cognitive level, there is not, not, nothing going on there, so it follows that, of course, we should be treating other people right. equally anyway. Okay, good point then. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. We are running out of time. Uh, we have you. about we, 20 we, more we questions, time. which is impossible to deal with. Um, Want to do one more? The, yeah, let's do a final question then online. Is that possible? Oh, that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> really? Do you know the word? We reckon we should <laughs> have the <laughs> bottle together with drink. the homie. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good final question. That's Asimo. actually, yes. The answer is definitely yes. Um, so here's it. So I was talking to somebody just this morning about my experiencing, uh, experiences debating creationists in the South, when I was in the South of the United States, in the Bible Belt. And you know, one of the things actually you cannot do is to ha go have a drink with an evangelical Christian because they drink only water. And so, which you know, makes sense. They're homeopaths, I, I suppose, in that sense. But 
so initially, when I started doing those debates, I was rather naive, and I thought, oh, you know, these people are idiots, and all I, here I come, the scientists, I actually know what I'm talking about. I'm going to just get, get to the podium, explain to them the thing, and they're surely going to walk out of the room completely convinced that, you know, that's, there's no problem. And of course, that never happens. Uh, but what did happen, and I learned fairly quickly, and therefore I sort of changed my strategy, I learned immediately that debates are not about, public debates, are not about truth and substantial arguments. They are about presentation style and personality. And the best thing you can do if you want to, if you hope to ever convince somebody on the other side is to show them that you're a nice person, <laughs> period. That if you get to the end of that debate and, yeah. and you're not being nasty, you're not insulting anybody, yeah. that's gonna do it. At the end of those debates, I can't tell you how many people came up to me and they said, well, you know, I still not necessarily believe what you said in, on stage, but it was nice to see that you were a nice person, that you treated your opponent with respect and all that. Because they really, truly expected me to show up on, on, on the stage spitting fire and, you know, with, with eating babies and things like that. Right, right. So right. you show them and it's like, you know, the first step is always about trust. You want to gain people's trust. Yeah. You want to, them to look at you not as an enemy, but as somebody that they may disagree with, but Very in a conversation. Very quickly, uh, I think I, I completely agree with that. Such a nice thing to say, by the way. I know, right? Um, <laughs> but it works even better <laughs> if, uh, in terms of cognitive dissonance, if you can first show that you're such a nice person, and then, oh, by the way, I am, I'm, I'm actually an atheist or a skeptic. Right. And, because if people already know that you're an atheist and a skeptic, there will be some of them, right. at least, will be very hostile and will sure. uh, be reluctant to interpret your, sure. your overall niceness. Yes, okay. if, you, if you can first, hide, it's better. First les lesson for today uh, seems to be be nice and skeptical, yes, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Massimo Pellucci yeah. and Michael Bedri. <laughs> <Amen. laughs>